Good morning and welcome to Church Online at South Putnam Church. Today we gather together as an online community to worship together and to share the love of Jesus. Welcome to Church Online. Hey, good morning, SPC. Welcome back to another week of Church Online. I'm Pastor Daniel, and welcome. Uh, I'm so glad that you are here today. We're going to engage together uh, as we all seek to discover who Jesus is and to learn to follow him one step at a time in our life and in our walk with Christ. So thanks so much for tuning in from wherever you are today. Uh, I want to tell you about a couple opportunities that we've identified that we can help serve our community. We believe that saved people serve people. And our job as the church is to help identify those needs and meet those needs within our community. Tomorrow, we're opening up our doors for our monthly Feed the Need ministry, um, our food pantry ministry where people can come who have need of food and we just give it to them. We just meet a need in their life. So if you are looking to serve in that ministry or you know or you have a need for food or know somebody who might, I would encourage you to come out tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, at, at the uh, Cube, 284 Union Avenue here in Crescent City. Again, that's 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Another opportunity that we have to engage uh, is a partnership that we have with our clinic, Putnam County Medical Mission. Uh, we are engaging with the Florida Baptist Convention as they bring down a mobile dentistry bus to help people who have dental problems and dental needs within our community. They're gonna be in Palatka. October 12th, which is a Monday through October 16th, a Friday. They're gonna be there five days. And we have an opportunity to help provide some support, some volunteers in other areas. Uh, so if you are looking to help serve in that, that week or one day or all every single day that week, we would encourage you to call the church office at 386-698-1054 so we can help you get signed up for that and ready. There's some training the week before that we'll have to go through one evening, a couple hours. But if you are looking to help serve um, in the month of October, we would invite you to do that and give us a call and we can tell you more about it. Um, it is with sadness and joy as well that I tell you that Miss Martha Sheridan, member of our church, uh, passed away earlier this week. And I just want to thank you, church, for being the church and for being there for, for people in their highest moments of needs. Um, and I just express the gratitude and the love that the Sheridans have poured out to our church uh, and, and just for being there for them during this time. And I wanna encourage you to continue uh, to pray for the Sheridans, to reach out to them and just express your love for them and, and help us as a church to meet their needs today. Uh, but we celebrate today that Miss Martha is in no pain today, that she is celebrating and worshiping Jesus at his feet and in his presence. And that is an awesome thing to think about. Uh, so thank you so much for loving the Sheridan family and, and for, for being a church uh, that just wraps our arms around people when they are hurting and when they have a need. So I am proud of you and thank you again. We're going to go ahead and jump into our sermon today. And we're talking about the book of James. We're wrapping up a, a, a series that we've done over the past four weeks. Uh, and I would just invite you to engage, to listen to God's word and allow it to change your life. Hey, good morning, SPC. Welcome back to Church Online. Today, we're going to jump into the final chapter of the book of James. Over the past four weeks, we've been opening up uh, God's Word and looking at every single verse and reading it together as James wrote his letter to the church. He wrote it to the church who was dispersed all around the ancient community that was growing um, in light of Jesus's resurrection. And you have to know that James was the half-brother of Jesus himself. So James gives us a very unique and personal, uh, practical example of living with Jesus, getting to hear his teachings, see his life, how he lived, and how he sacrificially gave his life for us. James' calling to us and his challenge to us is to examine our lives uh, and to see how it aligns with a life that is wholly devoted to God. But James doesn't just give us this book as an assessment tool. He doesn't tell us just to examine our lives, but he also gives us practical application of godly teaching, how we can grow closer to God. And James truly believed and taught us that the faith that we have, the faith in God and the faith in Jesus and who he was should be evident in how we live our lives, should be evident in the works that we do. In other words, the things that we do for God and people. So as we unpack this, I would challenge us to allow God to examine 
our hearts and our lives and our actions and allow us to allow him to teach us how to become wholly devoted to him specifically today we're going to talk about this idea and we're going to work up to it as we read through the chapter but we're going to live a life wholly devoted by practicing endurance through prayer by practicing endurance through prayer so we're going to get to talk about the power of prayer in our lives but we're going to start out um, in verse 1 where he's talking about and introducing kind of a different subject and working up to this idea so this is what he says in chapter 5 verse 1 he says come now you rich people Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. I think what James is trying to teach us here is that living a wholly devoted life, we must be very careful how we perceive and how we value material possessions in our lives. Um, as a wholly devoted follower of Christ, we should have an eternal perspective on wealth, on the things that we have in this world. See, if you take this scripture and you put it in the context of the entire word of God, we know that the Bible does not teach against wealth. It doesn't teach against a blessing in your life, financial, material, whatever it is in our lives. In fact, the Bible teaches uh, that the wise, the ones who are wise with what they have can become wealthy. They can be blessed with financial success. But here he's talking to a group of people who didn't quite understand that. He's talking to people who spent their entire lives accumulating all that they could accumulate in life uh, just for this material life that we live on earth. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Hoarders and people that have accumulated so much stuff in their homes and in their lives that they are literally buried alive by the things that they all have. And if you look around the room as you're watching that show, you'll notice that all of those material possessions are rotting away. They're not in good condition and they're just fading away. And that's the truth about everything we own. And we must keep an eternal perspective on what we have. The truth is, if you cannot take it with you into eternity, then we really don't own it. We might have it for a season, and everything, every good thing comes from God, and we just know that, but we're not going to take it with us. We only get one chance to do this right, and Jesus told us that it is more blessed to give, to give our stuff away than it even is to receive. It doesn't mean it's bad to receive. It doesn't mean it's bad to have things in our lives. But on this side of eternity, we only get one opportunity to receive that blessing, to be able to give to others. And I don't know about you, I don't want to come to the end of my life and have all of these things that I've acquired and worked so hard to possess. And I've, I've strived only for that in my life, only to die and have to leave it all behind and let someone else disperse it and someone else have it. I want to be involved in that blessing, blessing others, meeting needs in other people's lives. We have to maintain that perspective in regards to our finances. These are echoes of Jesus. As we read James's words, we get to, to see things that obviously he was influenced by Jesus's teaching himself. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said this, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know about you, but I want my heart in eternity. I wanna live this life within a perspective of eternity. And I wanna make the decisions that allow me to store up treasures in a place that I'm gonna to get to experience forever and ever. So the first warning that James has um, is have an eternal perspective on your wealth. James begins to speak about a more specific audience in verse four. He says this, he says, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out. The outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. James is talking here about 
a very specific law in, in the Jewish law at this time. See, there was a law in place that protected and was to the benefit of the poor, the most vulnerable population in this day who had to go work in the fields and at the farms uh, for the farm and land owners. But one of the laws that was in place to make sure uh, that they could survive, that they could just pay for food and the bare necessities that they had was at the end of every single laborer's day, they were required to pay that laborer what was due to them. So they would put in all their work and their efforts throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they would receive pay for that. And he's talking specifically about a group of, of farm owners who just weren't doing that. They were hoarding, they were staying, holding back the pay for their laborers um, so that they could live longer on more wealth. They could live luxurious lives so that they uh, could eat everything they wanted so that they can have a beautiful home to live in. And what they were doing was oppressing a population. And, and in that day, they even equated it to murder. And that makes absolute sense because if you are restricting the livelihood of the poor, that is their livelihood, that is their sustenance, that is how they put food on the table. And James is saying there's a group of people uh, that were holding that back just to live a more luxurious and wealthy life. But we know God is just, God is merciful, and God, and this scripture tells us um, that God has heard their cries, uh, that the Lord has heard and has been merciful to them. Jesus offered this same warning of judgment uh, to those that were engaged in this same act. He said, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are now full, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and weep. So James starts out as a warning to the rich, you know, talking about having an eternal perspective on money. And then he offers a warning to the unjust, to the oppressor, to the people who were just taking advantage of the poor. Then he makes this turn. And you have to understand this turn in relation to the audience that James is speaking to. See, James makes it evident in the next verse that he wasn't preaching directly and writing directly to those uh, farm, the slave owners or the, the people who were oppressing people to, to, to acquire wealth. No, in fact, James was actually talking to the Christians, the church, and he was talking to people within the church who were being oppressed, who were experiencing this suffering and this oppression uh, from these employers who were not paying, who were holding back that pay. We know this because in verse 7, he says this, therefore, in other words, in light of the truth I just talked about, in light of the oppression that we are experiencing, he has a word of encouragement. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. See, James is talking and giving an illustration that was really practical in that day. He was talking about awaiting a harvest. And if you're a farmer today, you know the weight and the endurance and the, the uh, patience that it takes to await a harvest. Watching a plant grow and produce fruit is worse than watching paint dry. And it seems to take forever we live in a world today that that's kind of foreign to us because we can walk in a grocery store right now and get fresh fruits and vegetables of any kind, any time of the year. We always have it available all year round, but that's not the case. That's not reality and they have to wait patiently. So here's where James starts talking about endurance. The main point of our talk today, he says this in verse nine, he says, brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. We talked about that last week. Uh, we don't judge others. God doesn't call us to do that. That is not our place. And the Bible even warns us that if we judge, we are subject to that judgment. But he says in verse 10, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. I find it really interesting and found out that this is the only reference uh, to the character of Job who's found in the Old Testament. There's a book 
titled Job. Job didn't write it, but it was about a man named Job. And they don't really know when it was written. They don't know who wrote it necessarily, but that, there's an awesome story to be had. But this is the only place in the New Testament that it talks about Job. And if you've never heard the story of Job and you don't know who he is, um, the, the Bible tells us that he was a blameless man. In other words, he was an upright man. He was without sin. He lived a righteous um, life. And though he was still human, um, he, he was a good, honorable man. And it talks about this instance uh, where God is talking to Satan and Satan is telling God that he, Job, um, only lives a blameless life because he uh, was only blessed by God. He didn't experience any suffering. In other words, it was easy to respect. It was easy to serve God when everything was going right in his life. So God understands it and he allows Satan to test him. He allows Satan to put him through suffering to test Job and to see if he will still serve God. And we know the story of Job um, is a tragic story. It is a story of suffering. He lost um, many or all of his possessions. He suffered from uh, painful sores all over his body. And see, Job is a human being, just like you and me. And if you read the story of Job, you'll know that throughout the story and while he was going through this suffering, he did many things. Job was very honest with God. Job struggled with God. Job questioned God. Job questioned and accused God of why he was going through what he was going through. But the end of the story is what James is talking about. James is talking about the conclusion, and eventually Job realized, he came to realize that his calling in life was to endure the suffering that he was going through, to not allow that um, to get in between his relationship and his trust in God. The way he did that, and the way we're going to talk about after this, is the way that, that Job was able to endure was actually through prayer. See, it says in Job chapter 42, verse 10, uh, this is what he says. After Job had prayed, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. See, he's talking about Job uh, because through all of the suffering, Job did have patience. And Job's relationship with God was sustained and he was, he remained faithful to him and he realized, you know what, God, you are so much bigger than me. You understand the formation of the world and everything within it. And I am no one to question you, but my faith isn't based upon what I'm going through. My faith is based upon who you are. And through all of the struggles and through all of the suffering that James went through, he was patient. And if we are patient as we go through suffering, that is endurance. That is endurance. See, the people that James was talking to, the Christians that he was talking to, at this time, they felt that it was the time for Jesus's return was far overdue. And that is crazy and kind of humorous to think because here we are thousands of years later. And honestly, many of us feel the same way. We are awaiting the return of Christ. And I think Job's story is a perfect example of, of why we are waiting. And, and, and the fact that as we wait, we will have suffering. And God calls us to endure this time and wait patiently for the Lord's return. The Bible tells us that we're waiting for the Lord's return. And, and while we are waiting and before he returns, every person will hear the gospel. Every person will have a chance to be saved and to turn to God. And it's kind of like sitting on a bus and waiting for people to get on the bus. And we have to just be patient. We have to endure the time that we are here on earth. But the truth is, we're, as we're waiting, we're, we're living in an imperfect world. We're, we're living in a place where sin is present. And there will be suffering on this side of eternity. Thank God, uh, through all of eternity, as we enter into heaven, there will no, be no suffering. There will be no tears. But while we are here, James is telling us, he wants us to be patiently waiting. He wants us to endure through uh, the struggles and, and the oppression and the suffering that we might go through. But how we do it is how James uh, appeals to us. The answer and the greatest power that we have within us to endure this time is through prayer. We are going to unpack prayer for a minute. Uh, but first, James threw in a little uh, extra verse here. And I think uh, there's a reason for it. But in verse 12, he says this. 
Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no, so that you will not fall under, under judgment. See, swearing here isn't saying a curse word, isn't profanity. He's talking about someone who, who supports something they are saying by taking an oath or swearing um, under God's name or under the Bible or, or anything like that. Um, usually when you hear someone say that, it's typically someone who lies a lot. And James is saying, if we're going to live a wholly devoted life, the things that we say are important. The things that we sh say should be truthful. When we tell somebody something, they should believe us just in our words because our actions um, represent what we say. In other words, if we say that we are going to do something or if we say that something is true, uh, we're going to do it and we really mean it. See, a Christian's, uh, a Christian's speech and talk should be truthful. No one should ever question the validity or the truth behind what we're speaking. So the first couple verses of this chapter is, is talking about endurance and it's warning us that while we endure while we wait for god to re jesus to return while we wait to be raptured while we wait for this period patiently we have to keep an eternal perspective on wealth on the things that we have we can't complain about each other or judge each other and we we should not swear we should just speak honestly we should speak truthfully but how we do that is is found in the next couple verses how we practice endurance through prayer is uh, how we practice endurance is through prayer it's through the practical application of prayer so james talks about how we do that in verse 13 he starts out by saying is anyone among you suffering he should pray is anyone cheerful he should sing praises 14 says is anyone among you sick he should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15 says, The prayer of the faith will save the sick person. The Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is very powerful in its effect. We're going to go back to those verses and talk about the power and the application of prayer in our lives as we endure, as we wait for Christ's return. But the next verse gives an example. James again picked a very powerful Old Testament Bible hero, a prophet by the name of Elijah. And in this day and age, Elijah was highly talked about. Elijah was seen as a superhuman prophet that when Elijah prayed, and when Elijah did things, uh, the, the whole course of nature would change. Um, see, but the, the truth is Elijah was a human being. He was just like you and I. But when he prayed, God altered the nature and the cycle of nature. He made mountains move. He made things happen. Um, power, there was power in Elijah's prayer. So James gives this example. He says, Elijah was a human being just as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. For three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. And then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. In other words, Elijah's prayers, the power behind the acts that he was performing as a prophet was found in his prayers. And when Elijah prayed, the rain stopped. Nature, the course of nature changed. When Elijah prayed again for the rain to begin, the rain started so many stories of the Bible of Elijah are found where he prayed and amazing things happened. There was a widow with a son who was sick and he was dying and it even says he stopped breathing. But Elijah was there and he prayed over him and asked God for life to enter back into him. And, and through Elijah's prayer, it says that that boy was raised again and he came to life. And in other words, he was healed. We know that at Mount Carmel, uh, a fire came down from heaven because of Elijah's prayer to his God to consume a burnt offering. And it was so that everyone around him would know that the Lord is God. See, James is telling us that Elijah's story should show us the power of prayer. Elijah's story should encourage us to pray 
uh, that the nature of our own existence and the existence of others could be changed. In other words, that, that our prayer can do mighty things. And the same prayers that Elijah prayed, we can pray today. We say this all the time around SPC, that there is power in prayer. Prayer is powerful. But as we go back a couple verses and we talk about James's application of prayer, not only is prayer powerful, but prayer is appropriate in every situation of our lives. James tells us that any time in our lives, what should we do as we endure, as we wait for Christ's return, uh, we should pray. If there's someone suffering, if there is someone going through trials and tribulations and hardships in their lives, it says that they should pray. If someone is joyful and experiencing blessing and, and just having um, a good time in their life, they should sing prayers of praise in their life. If someone is sick, and, and in other words, they can't even pray for themselves, that others and leaders in the church should join around them and pray for healing and pray for them, that if we have sin in our lives, the answer to that as well, in every situation, sin, we confess it to one another, we confess it to God, and what do we do? We pray. So the way, church, that we're gonna that we're gonna endure, as this chapter calls us to do, to be patiently awaiting the Lord's return, to be hopeful, to be looking forward to that, the way that we can practice endurance in our lives is through prayer. We have to have a strong prayer life in our own lives. James wraps up his thoughts here in his letter, and he says, my brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. I think this is incredibly important and, and so awesome that James ends this entire letter, five chapters as we know it today. He ends with two verses that talk about our responsibility and our behavior to help one another out in our own journey, in our desire and, and striving for living a holy, devoted life. James now, at the very end of the chapter, at the very end of his letter, empowers us to go to one another and to speak truth in love. See, the, ver the first 105 verses, I have challenged us to apply this to our own lives, to examine our lives, to see how we are living wholly devoted to God, to put into place practical applications. But I believe James um, doesn't want us to just assess what we're doing. Also, he wants us to put into place those practical applications in our life. But the last two verses, there's a huge shift. And as we know all that James taught us and how he's trying to encourage us and help us to live holy devoted life he's saying now now we can then turn to our fellow uh, brothers and sisters within the church and, and followers of christ and we can help them along in their journey see here's the thing we're not going to use this to judge we're not going to use the truth of god's word to judge people we're not going to use the truth of god's word to shame people to make them feel bad about where they are in life because we are all sinners saved by grace. But James is giving us permission here to when we see someone in our church and in the body of Christ straying away from the truth, we should have a desire in our hearts to share what we know, to share what we have applied to our lives, to share what James has taught us and most importantly, what Jesus has taught us. The Apostle Paul who wrote much of the New Testament uh, expounded upon this and talked about the importance uh, of helping our brothers and sisters in Christ live a wholly devoted life. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, uh, Paul says this, but see, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Speaking truth in love. It's okay to speak truth to another a Christian, to someone else who's following Christ, to share God's word with them, to help them along in their journey. But Paul warns us, we're going to do that with love. We're going to do that with mercy. We're going to do that with grace. We're going to love others as we would love 
to be loved. In other words, if someone, if we are doing something in our lives um, that is turning us away from God's word, that is turning us away from truth, we would want someone to come to us in a loving manner and help us along the way. Help us to see how we can live a holy, devoted life to Jesus. But here's the thing. Paul also says, let us grow. Let us grow in every way into him. Who? Jesus who is the head of the church, and that is Christ. See, this entire series, we've talked about living wholly devoted to Jesus, living wholly devoted to God our Father. We cannot do that without Jesus, without Him living within us. We can't do this on our own. We can't live a, a good life for the sake of being good. We cannot uh, take away the sin in our lives. Only Jesus can do that. The very first step to living a wholly devoted life is accepting Christ as our Savior. That should be our main motivation, uh, to teach people about who Jesus is. That should be the first place and the first person that we introduce uh, to the world. It is because of Jesus that we even have the letter that James wrote to us. The entire word of God exists um, because of Jesus. Jesus is found in the middle. The Old Testament points us to Jesus. The New Testament teaches us his life, what he did for us. And, and the New Testament challenges us to follow after him and gives us perspective that is eternal, talks about the future, talks about eternity in our lives, uh, but gives us this practical application like that's found in the book of James. So I would challenge you to, to, to study God's word. This book is so amazing, the book of James, but every single word of God is powerful. It's living, it's breathing. And every time we read it, uh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he teaches us uh, what God wants to say to us. It's how we spend time with God. It's how we grow wholly devoted to him. Uh, if you missed any of this series, I would challenge you to, to go back and examine these uh, scriptures and examine uh, the book of James together. And I want to challenge you uh, to, to look at the principles and apply them to your life, to allow us to patiently endure until Christ's return. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. But until he returns, the church is here for a reason. We are called to reach the lost. We are called to, to, to preach the gospel. We are called to be a safe haven for the sick and the hurting. I, I thank you so much uh, for your contribution and your part in the church. Christ is the head, but we are all members of that body. And it takes each and every single one of us doing our part to, to function, to, to accomplish the will of God in our lives. But the only way we can do that is to constantly strive to live wholly devoted to God. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today. God, thank you for Church Online and the experience that we get to share together. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for, for opening our eyes and our hearts and our ears, allowing us to see the truth that you have given us. God, I pray that you would use it to convict us and use it to teach us. Uh, Lord, and draw us closer to you, God, that we would apply what James has taught us today to our lives so that we can become wholly devoted to you, so that we can live a life that is evident of the faith in the transformation that you have created within us when Jesus came into our hearts. God, I pray if, if there's someone listening today who hasn't accepted Jesus as their savior, God, that they would understand and know that Jesus is your son. God, that you sent him to this earth uh, to live a perfect life, but to die for our sins. God, and to pay the price for all the sin that we have committed in, in, in this world, in this life. God, I pray that people would accept uh, that price that was paid. Lord, the salvation that you offer through Jesus and having faith in him, that he rose from the dead, that he conquered evil, he conquered sin, he conquered death in our lives. Lord, I pray that people would put their trust in him today. Lord, that they would welcome him into their heart today so that they can begin this journey of living wholly devoted to you, God, not as a burden. Lord, not, not to live self-righteously, God, but to honor and please you, our creator. God, we worship you and, and give you all the honor and the glory for all that is accomplished in and through your word and what it's going to do in our lives this week. Amen.